welcome to another episode of Hollywood Kitchen. And once again this week, the incredible Lara Gabriel is joining me from the Bay Area. And we are going to talk about silent film actress Billy Dove. We're going to talk about her life, her career, her films, and her food. So welcome, Laura. Thank you once again for joining me in all of my, my crazy Hollywood kitchen adventures. Oh, it's my great pleasure always. Yeah, you do such great work. Thank you. We're always Hollywood having kitchen. fun. Always having yeah, fun. Yeah, it's a great way for everybody to learn about the stars and the movies and, and do some cooking, which is always a good plus. Yes. And it occurs to me, you know, a lot of people may be watching this might not know who Billy Dove is. So, Laura, if you had to give somebody the 101 lowdown on Billy Dove, what would you tell them? Yeah, Billy Dove was um, an actress who started in the Ziegfeld Follies, was a big star in the silent era, went briefly into sound, and then retired and had a great life which is a um a really nice thing and she lived a really long time she lived to uh 94 i think she lived until 1997 so uh she had a good long life married i think she only married once which is a great thing <laughs> um you know she married a um a, a guy that she stayed with until her um until his death and had you know some kids and just was you know she's kind of a she's kind of a Hollywood happy ending story which is which is great and she was in a movie with Marion Davies her very last movie with was with Marion Davies and that was Blondie the Follies which is one of Marion's best films excellent so we'll, yeah. we'll talk all about Billy but first I do want to talk about the recipe because my cake making skills need help and I've only done one or two cakes I think on this show I did Anita Page's chocolate cake I did the Ava Gardner coconut cake, which honestly, Laura Stocker deserves all the credit in the world for that one. And then I did this feather cake recipe. And what I did is I made it in these pans because it's supposed to be a layer cake. And it's not as fluffy as I thought it would be. In fact, these are what the layers look like. So it's not bad. It's just not quite as, as fluffy as I, I thought. But the recipe, this recipe comes to us from the 1929 photo play cookbook, which I seem to have used these photo play cookbooks a lot more than most of the others. And the recipe in here, the cake recipe, calls for two and a half cups of flour, one and a half cups sugar, half cup butter, two thirds cup milk, two eggs, and baking powder to make the feather cake. Now, finding eggs these days is not easy. There is something going on in the poultry industry. I think it's a bird flu or something. Yeah, or something. I mean, there's some some egg shortage that, that is going on. Yeah. A couple of stores just to find the eggs to make this cake the other day. And the icing is what scares me here. Now, if, I don't know if any of you follow Fritzy Kramer of movies silently. Hats off to Fritzy. Totally dig her. She's awesome. And she made the actual Billy Dove recipe icing that is listed here. Fritzy goes where I, I do not always go because in the icing recipe, you're supposed to beat the whites of three eggs until stiff, boil two cups of pulverized sugar, one cup in boiling water until syrup threads, pour over the egg whites, very little at a time beating fast. Add a teaspoon of vanilla extract before the mass creams. I don't know. This sounded to me like a recipe for making scrambled egg whites. And one thing that I noticed about this recipe is that it was very um, unspecific. Like, like I wasn't quite sure whether to combine the ingredients, to combine the egg whites with the egg yolks. Like they didn't, there, there wasn't any direction to separate the egg whites from the egg yolks. Right. Um, but then all of a sudden it just said like, put the yolks in and then put the whites in. And I was like, I don't know what's going on. So I just used the yolks um, and I saved the whites for the for the um, icing. I don't know if it's going to totally ruin it. We'll see. Let me know how your icing turns out. So and then it really just says bake in medium oven, which is also vague. There's no temperature and there's no cooking time. I just put 350. I, you know, if it, if it's good, it's good. If it's not, it's not, I don't know. Billy Dove needs to be more. Kramer, 
Betsy Kramer did 350 degrees for 25 minutes. And that's okay. what she said to do. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to go with that. And what I decided to do at the suggestion of Mary Stanford, who is my very close friend and frequent collaborator, she sent me an, an icing recipe that doesn't involve eggs. And it's from Vintage Betty Crocker Cookbook. So I thought that's legit. And since I've already made the cake, because honestly, with all the mixing and stuff, it would just be so chaotic and noisy to do it on camera. I thought I would make the icing on camera if that's if that's cool. Yeah, it sounds great to me. Your cake's in the oven, right? My cake's still in the oven. It's still got another like 15 minutes to go. So I'm gonna I'm gonna cut out in about 15 minutes to go get the cake and then we'll see where we go from there. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. And I just did, I was I was questioning myself about Billy Dove being only married once because I was like, was she only married once? But it turns out she was actually married three times. But the first the first one was brief and the last one was very brief. And she was married to the same guy from 1935 to 1970. Yeah, so that's that's really good, right? For Hollywood, especially, that's that's kind of unheard of, actually. Yeah. Pretty rare. And her first husband was Irvin Willett, who was a silent film director. I saw we I think we saw together his film Behind the Door in San Francisco Silent. Yeah. And I read somewhere that he just pestered her like crazy to marry him until she finally just was like, OK, fine. Yeah. And she had a very famous affair with Howard Hughes. Yes. And they were together about three, three and a half years. And I, I posted this on social media. She did a really wonderful oral history interview with Turner Classic Movies. And in that interview, she will not talk about why they broke up. She doesn't mention it. Yeah, I mean, with Howard Hughes, it could be just about anything. Well, I think, too, he was such a serial womanizer. I mean, he was not a one-woman man. He just had to constantly move along, you know? So I, I would suspect that would probably be the number one reason. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah uh, probably. It would make sense. So, and yeah. that was in his early years in his heyday, too. So, mm -hmm. you know, and um, yeah, so you know what occurred to me? I need some hot water to do this icing. So, if oh, you want yeah. to get any early questions, I'm going to go heat the water up really fast. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so let's do some questions. Who's talking to us? Hi, Pre Devote says hi. Hello. Hi, Benjamin. Hello, Gary from Overcast and Wet Central California. You guys are getting all our rain. We had some rain this morning up here in Oakland, but now it seems to be clear and we seem to have sent it all to you guys. Hi, Karen. Um, hi, Danny on the road, but watching. Um, be careful. Don't crash into anything. Um, Kelly, my, I cut, I cut my sound for a second. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, um, uh, maybe you were hearing mine or something or maybe there's something with the with the connection when I cut my sound um oh yes uh Gary egg shortage um <laughs> no one has been the victim of foul play f-o-w-l oh dear um avocados are a great egg replacer for baking that's what I hear I've never tried it but I've heard that from some vegan friends uh, old time icing was often cooked, right? So the, the icing recipe, the part of this recipe has icing and they say to boil the sugar uh, and and pour it over the egg whites until it's kind of syrupy. So so yeah, this is uh, this is cooked, cooked icing, which is great. Um, Behind the door was such a movie. Uh, Aquafaba is also an amazing replacer for egg whites. What's aquafaba? Do you know what that is, Carrie? I have no idea what that is. I I don't know either. Um, <laughs> who asked that question. Pre devote uh, uh, said said that. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe pre devote can can answer. Uh, Gary Gary says that he watched that TCM interview with her earlier this morning on YouTube. Totally fascinating. Knew very little about her till now. Yeah, not a lot of people know a lot about her. Just yeah. I think because she retired so early in the thirties. And again, she doesn't really, have, except for maybe Blondie of the Follies. I think Blondie of the Follies is probably her best known movie. Oh, definitely. And, yeah. And, and she doesn't really have that movie that people, that people see. No Wizard of Oz on that filmography. Yeah. Right. Or Gone with the Wind or yeah. anything like that. Start the, the, the um, frosting. I always like to do the food first so that I can sort of relax and just talk about the start. 
The creamy glaze from the Betty Crocker cookbook involves one third cup of butter or margarine. So put this in my trusty little hot plate. Wonderful. Oh, okay. Peter Boche says that aquafaba is water from chickpeas, which makes a whole lot of sense. Aqua faba, fava bean, right? Aqua, water, water bean. <laughs> That's cool. So yeah, that makes sense too, that it would make a good egg replacer. It seems to have the right consistency. You know, I didn't really know kind of what to do when I, I realized this was such a problem. I was like, I didn't know what to substitute. And I, I guess I could have Googled it or looked it up. But uh, yeah, it's it's an interesting time. I When I finally did find eggs, though, they were like seven, eight dollars for like a little Yeah, bit. exactly. There's one place in my neighborhood that has eggs right now. Safeway doesn't have them. Um, none of the other grocery stores in the area have them, but there's one on Piedmont Avenue that that has them and so that's where we've been going yeah there's so many things that have happened over the last several years that if you told me ages ago would have happened I would have thought that was the craziest South Park episode ever yeah and just stuff like you know when the pandemic hit here in LA there were so many things I just could not find it was insane I never thought I'd live in a world where I couldn't find paper towels or I couldn't yeah, find people towels. were hoarding and Everything, it's such a funny phenomenon that people hoard toilet paper and paper towels. Like those are the things that people hoard. Just craziness. Yeah. I'm melting the butter here on the hot plate. The hot plate does take a little bit of time. So, so bear with me. And um, let's see here. Maybe we should just start talking about Billy Dove films while I do this. Sure. Because yeah, she was in the Follies and she was so incredibly beautiful. And she was. And she wasn't she wasn't like a classical beauty. Like I see I put her in sort of the same um category as like Eleanor Boardman. Like she and Eleanor Boardman have a similar type of unusual beauty. Patrician. Yeah, kind of, yeah, yeah. But, but unusual. Like 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 they both have um you know, not very classically beautiful noses and kind of big foreheads and the, but, but they're both really appealing, like very beautiful women, both of them. Well, talk to me about what life would have been like for Billy and Marion as chorus girls, because you've, you've said in your book and many times that that was kind of the happiest chapter of Marion's life. And I can't remember, did she and Billy know each other in the Follies or were they at different times? I no, know they were, they were at different times. Um, Billy was a little bit younger, a little bit younger than Marion. So she was later, I think. Um, they weren't together in the Follies, but but um, but for Marion, I can I can speak about about Marion's experience in the Follies and the Ziegfeld shows and the Dillingham shows that she like like you said, um, she had the most fun of her entire life in those shows. She thought it was the coolest thing to be around all these these other other girls and um and uh she she never when she was older she didn't like to talk about her movie days she thought that was kind of boring like she it was it was work right it was work for her she she got up in the morning and went to the studio and came home and ate dinner and then went to bed during the week and um but in the follies she would she would uh, have a show, uh, you know, in the in the evening. They would maybe rehearse during the day, have a show in the evening, and then they would stay up all night having fun. She would she would oh, party. Yeah, she would go to these these parties. Like they would meet at somebody's house, you know, Anita Luce's house or her house or or Justine Johnstone's house, and they would just like play games and and just have a have a lot of fun. And so she she felt that that was that that was her uh, preferred way of living, you know, and staying up at night and then sleeping late. She would sleep and, you know, after she retired, she reverted to this, to this sleep schedule of staying up all night and then sleeping late, like as late as like four in the afternoon. So, wow. so, um, so, so she liked that, but Billy, I'm, I'm not sure if, um, if that routine continued on later in in the Follies years but um but that's what it was like for Marianne now for Billy she made her film debut I believe in 1921 
But the silent film that she's best remembered for, I would say, is with Douglas Fairbanks in The Black Pirate. Yeah, exactly. Is anything Fairbanks was in, obviously that's going to get a tremendous amount of attention. Yeah. And she's really good opposite him. She definitely holds her own opposite the swashbuckling king of Hollywood. Yeah. And she's quite a good actress. Oh, yeah, she really is. And she, as she said in the TCM interview, by the way, I've added the powdered sugar to the butter. I'm now going to add the vanilla extract. Good. And a little bit of the water here. But as she said in the uh, TCM interview, Mary Pickford was not letting Fairbanks kiss another woman, even if it was in the name of a role. So at the end of the Black Pirate, it was Mary Pickford. He was kissing and not Billy Dove. Right. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, hold on just one second, because I think the cake is ready. Hold on. I'm going to go get it. <laughs> Okay, so those of you who are following, I am currently stirring up the icing mix here. I had to turn down the hot plate just so I don't burn it. Okay. I've noticed when making this icing, by the way, it tends to get thick really, really fast, which is probably why the Betty Crocker recipe says to add a few teas, two to four tablespoons of hot water. So. I'm going to kind of keep doing that here. So the frosting is a little thinner and not super, super thick. Okay, the cake needs a few more minutes. Okay, so my frosting is pretty good right now. So you know what, I think I'm going to pour it on top of the cake and see how this, how this turns out. Um, right. the is asking, wasn't Blondie of the Follies recently screened at the American Cinema Tech, was it? I don't think it was, but I'm. It, it will be screening at UCLA Film and TV Archive, right, Laura? Yes, and I will be introducing it. So if you'd like to come, if you'd like to come and hear me talk about Marion and Billy Dove and fangirl over everybody, then come. Yes, that will be fabulous. I definitely plan to be there. Now, when Billy Dove made a transition into sound. Of course, as we know, that was a very interesting time in film history. And I kind of want to talk to you about, to everybody watching, I guess, about the two Billy Dove movies I watched last night. Because Ooh. I had seen a few of her films, but there were definitely some gaps in my Billy Dove viewing. And I thought, well, I'm going to see what I can locate that's available and, and go from there. Yeah. I wound up with gaps in mine, too. It's I feel like oh, everybody has Billy Dove gaps. Yeah. Gaps in general, you know, I think a lot, there's a lot of kind of shaming that goes on in the film history world. And if you ever utter the words, oh, I haven't seen that, people tend to judge you or be really unkind. And I, I hate that because for me, I'm a very curious person and I want to see everything I can get my hands on. There are only so many hours in the day. I have to work. I have responsibility. I do the best I can. So I kind of hate when people try to shame others like, oh my God, you have, it's like, come on you know you yeah know. and 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 I really love when people own that they that they have gaps because we all have them everyone has them and so to pretend that you don't is is you know in insincere like yeah, yeah like my my blind spot is I is is noir like I've seen kind of the major ones but like almost every time Eddie has the the uh, film noir series mm -hmm. uh, noir alley on on TCM you know most of the time they're movies I haven't seen and it's really cool well to Eddie's credit too he really dips into the vault for even people that are hardcores like me he finds stuff that's like hey there's this Argentinian noir you probably haven't seen and you need to so yeah I mean, it would be easy just to trot out double indemnity and postman and the the big ones which they do yeah Eddie really goes deep into those vaults and God bless him for that. Um, yeah, love it. And he and he finds really great movies to screen too. It's like, oh, you have to see this one. And foreign ones too, which I love as well. But yeah. Yeah, to me, I just feel like, yeah, there's no shame in admitting you haven't seen something. There's not enough hours in the day to see everything. But what I did, I'm a very intellectually curious mind. And if I haven't seen something or done something or been somewhere, most of the time, my response is, wow, that's on my list. I can't wait to see that or go to that place or do that thing. So for me, it's not the not doing it. It's just I'm hoping to get to it eventually. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, that. yeah, exactly. But, so regarding Billy Dove. OK, so I got two DVDs from Warner Archive here. 
The first one that I watched last night on my little Billy Dove Fest was One Night at Susie's right here, which by the way, I can loan you these when you're in town next. So nice. this one, I would actually call this kind of a little proto-noir. It is, the, the title One Night at Susie's is a little bit misleading because you tend to think, oh, it's a romantic bedroom comedy. Kind of, It's so not that at all. Mm -hmm. She plays an actress on Broadway who falls in love with a very young and adorable Douglas Fairbanks Jr. And I don't want to give it all away in case any of you see it, but there is a scene in the film where something goes horribly wrong with a producer who basically sets Billy Duff up and he assaults her. And you don't need, they don't physically say those words, but when Doug Jr. walks in and she's standing there in tears with this wild eyed look in her eyes and her dress is ripped, you know what happened. You know, the, you don't need dialogue to say what happened there. And Douglas, even though, uh, I don't wanna spoil it for people, but long story short, Doug Jr. winds up taking the rap and going to jail, going up the river, as they said at the time. <laughs> Meanwhile, he's a playwright and he's writing all these plays that make Billy Dove a major, major Broadway star. And she's taking credit for them, which he asks her to do. Meanwhile, there's a lady named Susie, the person of the title, who basically, I'm a little confused, she seems to run a boarding house for reformed gangsters and criminals. At least that's kind of what I took away from the film. And she's kind of trying to help Billy Dove and help Fairbanks Jr. and help different ex-mobsters kind of walk the narrow path of life as much as they are capable of doing. And this is a really, it's kind of an interesting little film. It's definitely a crime film. It's definitely kind of got a courtroom drama aspect to it. And Billy Dove is really terrific in this movie. And as I said, especially in the scene where he walks in and just sees her. And I think once again, those silent film acting chops come into play because the way she just stands there and looks at him, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, she's she's great. She's a fantastic actress. My The oven is yelling at me, so I'm going to go see once more. You can maybe talk about the other movie if you'd like while I'm yeah. going, and I'll come back in a minute. Absolutely. All right, see you in a minute, second, everybody. Okay. okay, very cool. Anyway, but this is an interesting little film. I'm not going to say it's a masterpiece by any means, but if you are curious about Billy Dove and you're also curious about very, very early Warner Brothers First National or Douglas Fairbanks Jr. or crime dramas, then I would definitely recommend checking this one out. Okay. Now, the other Billy Dove film that I watched last night was a real, it was kind of a head scratcher. I should probably wait a minute until Lara comes back to talk about it because I definitely love chatting with her about these things too. But this was definitely a very interesting curio. That's how I would personally describe it. So let's see. Okay, we... I'm back and the cake still needs more time. I did want to talk about this movie without you because this, oh, is, okay. this is a fun one. Okay, this movie is called The Man and the Moment. And it was written by Eleanor Glynn, who wrote It for Clara Bow. She wrote, I think, His Glorious Night for Jim Gilbert. Um, she wrote for Gloria Swanson and Valentino. And she was sort of the Jackie Collins or Danielle Steele of her day, these kind of uh, torrid, romantic melodramas. And It, I think, was more of an exception. It was more of a comedy. But a lot of these are just these romantic things. And this one is very strange. And I will definitely loan this to you when you're in LA soon because it's one of those transitional films that bridges the gap of silent and sound. When they would shoot, as you know, they yes. shoot a silent version and a sound version. And depending on which theaters had or had not converted, they'd release it accordingly. Yeah. So in this case, this is what's weird about this. Okay, I was initially intrigued because, okay, it says on the back here, the Man and the Moment was considered a lost film until 1935 elements were discovered in Italy. A prime example of how silent films made the transition to sound. This beautifully restored print is synced to the original Vitaphone discs and features talking sequences, music, and sound effects as audiences first heard them in 1929. Oh, so, I love that. It's just the classic story, right? It's the classic story of finding lost films. Yes, which I always burn the candle of hope that these will turn up somewhere. The, what makes this one interesting is even in the dialogue sequences, they still use title cards. And I was kind of like, but I just heard him say that. Why do I need to see the title card? So they do that a lot. 
And also the plot is bonkers. There's like, they love each other, they hate each other, they fight. Um, there's a scene where she's a female aviatrix and she crashes her plane into the ocean, which naturally she's rescued by a handsome man with a luxury yacht because that's always- Yeah, aren't we are. all? And we all, it happens to me every day. Yes. And then there's another scene in the movie where miraculously the plane is salvaged from the ocean fully intact and operable again. And she runs away from Rod LaRock, jumps in the plane in a chiffon gown and heals with no goggles. And of course flies and crashes the plane into the ocean a second time, but a second time there's someone there to rescue her and all is good. And Rod LaRock was also- That poor plane. You're, I can't wait to see your reaction when you see this. We have to- <laughs> Oh, funny. So, Rock Rock was also a silent film star, but unlike Billy Dove, I don't think he has an innate understanding of sound film acting. Because in this film, even though the plot is like crazy, Billy Dove is still very good. She's very, she comes across really well. Mm -hmm. Rod LaRock, you are going to restrain yourself from laughing because here's what he does. Like, my darling, it is so nice that you have come to my party. Oh, yes. Let's go down to the yacht. It's like an hour and a half of that. And you're like, oh, poor guy. But this is not going to be an easy one to sit through. This is going to be tough. And that it, poor guy. It, I almost kept thinking, do they have cards right off camera and he's reading them? Is he? I mean, what's he the first time? Yeah. Is he, is he extremely nervous? Is he not used to acting in sound? I mean, it kind of begs a lot of questions. And so my, my thing is here, the rareness of this, the fact that it was discovered after being lost, that's kind of what drew me into buying this copy. But what I will say is that if you were the casual film fan or observer, you were probably not going to enjoy this. You were probably going to think it's insane. But if you're like Laura and I, and you pretty much eat, sleep, drink, and breathe classic Hollywood and its history, and you want to see something that was right at the cusp of the silent to sound transition, and you have a lot of patience, then see this. <laughs> That's kind lots of, of patience is needed. Huh? I said lots of patience is needed. Lots of patience. And you need to go in knowing, okay, this is not going to be a dazzling cinematic masterpiece. If I get through it, I'll be doing real well. So you have to kind of go into it. As my mom would say, it's about adjusted expectations in life sometimes. And, um, yes. And then there's sometimes another- You have to adjust your expectations. Yes, indeed. Yes. And there's another Billy Dove film that I saw a few years ago. It was produced by Howard Hughes. It is an aviation comedy. It's called Cock of the Air. And it is- Oh, yes. Oh, right. That one. It implies it's about a rampantly womanizing pilot who romances Billy Dove. I, was I remember I remember everybody snickering over that title a few years ago. Yeah, you, you know Howard Hughes came up with that. But I saw this film at the Academy in Hollywood several years ago for a restoration. And I think they might have even shown it at TCM one year too. But I don't believe it's on DVD. So if you want to try to track it down, I normally do not recommend bootlegging things. But there are some cases where that's the only way you're ever going to see it. So if you can locate any way, shape, or form, cock of the air, do it because yes, Debbie, and that film is really funny. Debbie just just said, please say the name of that film again. So you just did it for her. Cock of the air. <laughs> yes. By the way, uh, your 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 mother is watching. So. <laughs> um, but, um, so, um, but it's it's a fun movie. It's very, very, very pre-code. Howard Hughes was almost bent on flaunting the production code at every single possible turn. And uh, one thing I do remember from Cock of the Air, beside the delightful title, was the fact that Billy Dove's gowns are so skimpy and so revealing in that movie. It is just, wow. <laughs> it's really, it's really wow. That's kind of the only word that I have. It's like, it's like, um, Jean Harlow's line in Red Dust. Can you see through this? I'm afraid you can, miss. I'll wear it. I'll wear it. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true. It is yeah. so true. Because, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that gown, those gowns are really, really wild. And then, of course, we get to Blondie of the Follies, which Billy Dove made at MGM with Marion Davies. You know, one reason I've always been drawn to this film, Lara, is the pearl skirt. Billy Dove what wears what looks to be 
a very, very skimpy skirt or maybe mini sarong that appears totally made of pearls. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, I, I don't have any stories about it, unfortunately, but uh, some of it's these candy. are quite something. <laughs> yeah, and Marion's too, like that big, tall, like feather thing that she wears at the end. Um, yeah. Some yeah. of the movies you think Adrian must have just had such a blast coming up with some of these costumes and trying to see maybe what he could get away with. Yeah, right. Well, one thing I wanted to talk about was um, in your book, you talk about how the first screening of Blondie of the Follies didn't necessarily go in Billy Dove's favor here. So talk to us about what happened there. Wait, the first screening of Blondie of the Follies? And they showed it and her said, wait a minute, this is a great Billy Dove movie. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, uh, right. So, um, so Hearst was, was, uh, was upset that, that Marion wasn't kind of the center of attention in this movie. It's very much an ensemble movie. I mean, even, even in its final cut, it's very much an ensemble movie. The initial, uh, the initial title was Three Blondes. Uh, and it was a, it was a, um, you know, a, a movie that was, that was supposed to be about, uh, you know, several, several women, yeah. uh, and, and Hearst made Francis Marion and Anita Luce make all these changes to it. And after the, uh, after, after all of the debacles with changing the script and making it more Marion centered and essentially ruining this, the story that, that uh, that had initially been written, Frances Marion swore off working with Hearst. She said, I don't wanna, I don't wanna, I will never do this again. She ultimately did do it again. <laughs> she kind of forgot about that she had it's said that. Right, but, um, but it's, it, it speaks a bit to how controlling Hearst was of, of Marion's image and, and how everything Marion did, even at this point in time, which was, after he had come around to Marion in comedies, after he, after Marion had really asserted herself and said, this is what I want to do, Hearst couldn't really shake this sense of Marion having to be perfect and the center of attention uh, at all times. So, um, so yeah, that's what happened with with Blondie of the Follies. There's a really interesting script conference about, uh, about Blondie of the Follies. And uh, let's see who was there. It was Paul Byrne, Anita Luce, I think, was there. Uh, there were a few other people. I think Thalberg was there as well. Anyway, they were talking about what to do with this script, how to how to bring it to the screen. And you can see reading this story conference how Hearst Hearst wasn't there, but how uh, people were talking about him and what he would accept in these veiled terms that if you read into it you can see that this is what they're talking about they're talking about Hearst having these designs for a movie that was going to be starring Marion Davies so yeah one thing that really kind of stayed with me when reading your book about Marion Davies was again how he couldn't let go like he tried to let her go doing comedies but then he kept wanting her to be the ethereal virginal heroine that she was like in the teens like what I don't know. I just wish he could have just let, given up, not been so controlling over everything she did. Like, why couldn't he go, okay, I'm a publisher. That's what I do. That's my thing. <laughs> like, why couldn't he have just said, you've got great instincts, go shine, do your thing, and just let her kind of have control over her own life and her own career and not constantly try to direct everything. Yeah. And I think that he, this was a fault of his, right? This was a, this was a, uh, a, a flaw in his character. And I think that he knew that uh, to a certain extent, but he couldn't help it. Like he couldn't control himself. Um, and and he would sometimes kind of give in to people, you know, like when somebody would tell him, you got to stop this, you know, when somebody would stand up to him and say, this is bad for Marion, this is bad for the industry or 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 whatever, he could, could say, okay, yeah, I see what you mean. So what about if we did, you know, and then he would kind of go back, right? He, he couldn't help himself. Uh, and, and I really do think that he, he had what he thought was Marion's best interest at heart. 
but uh, he was just unable to see past the end of his nose in so many ways. And he was more than a publisher, you know, like he was, he, of course, a publisher first and foremost, but he had been doing films. He'd been in the film industry since the 1890s. I mean, since the very, very beginning, sending camera crews down to Cuba and himself, he himself went down to Cuba in, for this to film the Spanish-American War in real time. So he was also very much a movie producer. I mean, a movie yeah. mogul. Yeah. Um, so, so I think that too prevented him from pulling back and saying, this is not my space. Yeah, because it was his space. Yeah, just it must have been hard for her too, just to be under someone's control that much. I don't know. That would have been really hard for me to swallow that. Uh, yeah, but I also, but I also think that that Marion, like, like, like we've been through before, Marion made all her own decisions. If she wanted to leave, she could have left, and she would have left. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that she she stayed with him because she loved him and because this was her work and and she enjoyed her work and it was it was fine it was not maybe what she had her heart mindset on but Hearst was her boss I mean Hearst was her romantic partner of course as we know but also her boss at work and so she had to sort of have this balance between this is the man I love and I care for him and this is my boss at work and I need to, I need to push a little bit to get what I need. It, it's sort of an interesting dynamic between them. Oh, definitely. Absolutely. It's very unusual too, I think. Yeah. It's yeah. Awesome. But it was Marion's reality. And, and as for being difficult, I think it was just how it was. Yeah. Yeah. Leslie, by the way, um, Leslie Apple uh, commented on my little personality poster back there. That's my, that's, Marion uh in the personality poster from MGM yeah and uh, also these the, you might be able to see as well these things back here uh I, everything's reversed uh that thing uh that thing right there is a soap dish from Marion's house uh oh, okay. it's yeah it looks like a statue but it's actually a soap dish I can bring it closer hold on I'm gonna oh, bring it Here it is. This is Marion's. Um, and yeah. So, and then these are her atomizers as well. We're having a little show and tell. I love show and tell. Why not? Show and tell. This is Marion's uh, Murano glass atom atomizer given cool. to me by the family. That's got to be really special when the family gives you something like that. Yes, it is. That's kind of total faith in you yeah yeah it was really really wonderful when I when I got those things I was just like it felt so warm and fuzzy oh one more thing for show and tell can I do one more thing for yes. show and tell you can talk as long as you want I will never stop a show and tell I'm happy. okay one more thing for show and tell this thing over here is Marion's embroidery so look at that for people who know embroidery um that's how she embroidered and on the back this is the back which i'm told for people who know embroidery i'm told that the back is really the the tell for how good of a piece it is and and marion's back looks almost exactly like the front it looks so professional yeah so so that's what i like to I bring I bring this to a lot of my presentations because um, she was really an expert craft person. And a lot of people don't know that. You know, there's always so much to learn about these people because people are so much more complicated and multifaceted than I think people realize. Yeah. I have a bit of show and tell also. Let me get it here. Um, this is a beautiful photo of Billy Dove. It is original to the era that Darren Barnes, my Norma Shear friend, loaned me for this episode. And also, this is in a 19, um, early 30s Art Deco frame, courtesy of my friend Donna Hill in San Francisco. 
And my friend Steve Suttle in Albuquerque, New Mexico, he is a friend of mine. I met him through the San Francisco Silent Film Festival, and he recently gifted me some pieces of his silent film little archive. And one of them was an autograph by Billy Dove. And it says, greetings, Edwin Powell Hall, Billy Dove. So. Look at that beautiful handwriting. Great. And yeah, another thing as we've talked about, I think is interesting about Billy was just the fact that, yeah, she was able to have a happy life beyond Hollywood because it seems to me like there are certain stars that are able to walk away and they're able to kind of find other hobbies, interests, things to do with their lives. And then there's others who can't either for financial reasons or just emotional reasons. And they have to work like right up until the bitter end or at least try to. Yeah. So it seems kind of good that Billy had the attitude of, you know what, there's more to life. There's more I can do. And she just wanted to move on to a new chapter. Yeah. And, and good for her. I mean, I, I feel like a, a lot of people judge, you know, a lot of people judge people who, who decide to quit the industry in their prime or, or for, for reasons that are all their own. And I think people forget that these are human beings who are entitled to a personal life, who are entitled to live their life the way they want to live it. And so good for Billy Dove for just making that decision and doing it for herself. Yeah. And she did not seem to regret it either. And that kind of reminds me of our mutual friend, Cora Sue Collins. I mean, Cora Sue was like, I'm done. I'm ready to walk away. And next chapter. Yeah. And good for her. Or a long time ago, in 2006, it was the centennial of Janet Gaynor, and I went to the Academy Tribute, and the son she had with Adrian was there, and he was, he was really nice, and when he talked about her, he said he didn't grow up in Hollywood per se. He said that it was like when Janet left films, that chapter was closed. He said he never even saw the Oscar that she won until it was in high school, and he said she kept it in the attic. And I thought, yeah. wow, that's really interesting that she just sort of closed that book, put it on the shelf, metaphorically, and that was it, you know? Yeah, and Marion's uh, Marion's great niece, who uh, I've become really close to, she said that when she was a kid, Marion would show her her sound films and the ones that she thought that she would like, you know, and wouldn't show her her silence because she thought that they wouldn't be interesting to her and um, and and all of that and it's sort of like it's sort of like she understood that that the movies were I don't know that that the movies were a time in her life that maybe wouldn't necessarily be terribly interesting to her to her great niece but but wanted to show her all the same that she was in movies and so here's here are a couple that might be interesting to you and so it always breaks my heart, though, too, that there was such almost an immediate stigma against silence when sound came in. Like, there were stars that denied ever having made a silent, like Dietrich, when it's obvious they made them. And yeah, like, whoa. Turned their back on silence as if it were outdated, passe, and even made them look older. So yeah. it's sad because, to me, silent film is such an incredible art form. And to just feel like it was something to be embarrassed by is really sad to me that people thought that way. Yeah, and I, with, in terms of Marion's um, relationship to her silent films, she talked about them and she was very... Uh, very available to talk about her her silent films if somebody asked but um but uh you know what was I going to say about that <laughs> I feel like there was somewhere I was going and I forgot where I was going um I do that all the time it's oh great. oh yeah no where I know where I was going she kept all her movies her uh she she stored them in in her home and so those movies when she died went to preservation first they went to the afi then they went to the library of congress and that's where they are today so a lot of these screenings you know when you see show people or something at a at a screening and the print came from the library of congress that's marion's own personal print so she uh even though even though you know she might not have shown the these silent films to her family because she thought they might not have been interested she recognized 
that these were things, these were precious things, and she willed them to preservation when she died. So that's a really, really great thing. Yes. Laura, let's plug some of your upcoming Mary Davies events because you have got quite a schedule coming up. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So um, this coming week on Sunday, on the 22nd, January 22nd, I'll be at the Hollywood Heritage Museum to do a presentation about Marion and we'll watch Sandra the Great, 1925, Marion's first movie made entirely in California. And then the next thing, the next thing I'm doing is February 4th and 5th, I'll be at the Wilder Theater in LA. We'll, we're doing show people and a Q&A and a book signing. Um, which is inside the Hammer Museum. Yes, the inside the Hammer Museum. Uh, and then, and then uh, the second night, I think is that Blondie the Follies night? I think, I think so. I think, I think the second day is Blondie the Follies. I'll have to check. But anyway, we're, uh, there's two, da two days of Marion Davies movies, um, the fourth and the fifth. Then the second part of that retrospective is the following weekend at the Wilder. And then there's a week off. And then the week after that, I will be in Kansas for the Kansas Silent Film Festival, the last weekend of February. And if you're around the area, if you're in the Midwest, it's free. Uh, so so come on down or up or wherever you are. <laughs> I've been to that Kansas. festival a few years ago. It's a lot of fun. Cool. Yeah, I'll be giving the, uh, the, the cinema dinner talk Excellent. and introducing Little Old New York. Okay. And also, Mary Davies continues to screen this month on Turner Classic Movies. She does indeed, yes. So you can go to tcm.com and view the schedule for that. Yeah, and in fact, in fact uh, Blondie the Follies is on this week. Blondie the Follies is on uh, second? Second, I think. Uh, first is Bachelor Father, and then second, I think, is Blondie of the Follies. And then also the Marion Davies Beach House um, is having their annual Marion Davies birthday party at the end of the month as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm not going to that. Um, but it's always a lot of fun and they're, they're going to have a, a little table where you can, where you can get the book if you'd like to. Excellent. So should we yeah. see if we have any other questions or comments on Billy Dove? Sure. Uh, people are asking questions about Marion. <laughs> Danny, Danny asked if I could move my camera down and touch. I saw that and I moved it down a little. I hope that I hope uh, it's okay. Um, a soap dish that was Marion's and those atomizers are lovely. I do embroider work in Marion's book looks excellent. Yes, she was very good at this stuff. Um, oh, Danny says that's a real movie star signature uh, talking about Billy Doves. Yeah. Yeah, I love that handwriting. Yeah. Um, Danny asked, did we already talk about Billy Dove's family? Are her kids still alive? Do you know if her kids still are still alive? I don't know. It's a great question that I don't have the answer to. Probably we could probably do some research and find out. I didn't but do no, that research, but not too far from where I live. She is at Forest Lawn Glendale. Right. And I think she's interred under her actual name, her original name, not not Billy Dove. Yeah. Um oh and Chris asked. Her, huh? mom was, her moniker was the American Beauty. That's what right. that's what she so often referred to as, and she starred in a silent of that name, which sadly that one is lost. Yeah. Um, Krista asked Laura, did Marion talk to Robert Montgomery after they starred together twice? I choose to believe they did. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I don't have, I don't think that he was, was he at the circus party? Um, I'll have to look at my footage of the circus party to see if Robert Montgomery was there, it's possible. But um, but yeah, they they were friends. Uh, they didn't, you know, after Marion retired, there weren't a whole lot more parties, uh, you know, at, at the beach house or, or San Simeon because of Hearst's advancing age and the money situation. So I'm not sure how much they saw of each other, but Marion had a, uh, a, a real fondness for Robert Montgomery. She liked him a lot. Okay. Any other questions? What else have we got? Um, Tabitha George says, hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Um, come to the Twin Cities. Oh, is that is that to me? Come to the Twin Cities? I really would love to come to the Twin, Twin Cities. I've been to Minneapolis um, once and um, 
made it a point to see the Mary Tyler Moore statue. So, as one does. As one, as one does. does, exactly. Um, Required viewing. Yes, exactly. Uh, Danny, I don't know who sponsors the Kansas Island Film Festival. I think the costs are defrayed, but the cinema dinner is a ticketed event. And I think that local businesses maybe sponsor it. I'm not really sure. Um, yeah, and I think if he was with his wife, Elizabeth, who his daughter is named after, I think if he was, if he was, he was with his wife. Oh, yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Okay, oh, I know what you're talking about. So, like, if he was at the party. Yeah, sure. Um, and I really, really wish that I had gotten to talk to Elizabeth Montgomery because Marion really loved her co-star's children uh, and her, you know, the people she worked with, their their children. She loved kids. And and so I have a, I have a, a sneaking suspicion that she probably showered baby Elizabeth with gifts, <laughs> you know, quilts and stuffed animals and dolls and things like that. That's that's what I think. And I really wish that I could confirm that with her because that's what she did for her friend's kids. She just gave them tons of gifts. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, it, would you be willing to go on Facebook and answer any other questions that roll in after the episode? Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. And we're still going to do one more episode this month together to celebrate Marion's friends and co-stars. Yeah. Um, not next weekend, but the week after, we will be making the Dorothy McHale popovers. Yes. Yes. And Danny, if you're watching, can we come to your house? <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah. So Dorothy McHale, as we called it, Dorothy McHale's aggressive popovers. Yes, because the aggressive popovers. Aggressive so popovers because the directions are really like, do this, don't do that. Nah. Attic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we have to, we have to, you know, listen to whatever Dorothy McHale says or else she'll yell at us. Absolutely correct. Well, yeah. thank you again so much for joining me. And I do have a Patreon, by the way. Um, all contributions help pay for groceries because that's not always cheap. And um, thank you to everybody who watches, who comments, who shares. I really appreciate it. And please stay tuned for more food fun and film history. Thank you, Carrie. I, I want to give a shout out to you too, because because you make everybody's Sunday brighter with right. with these <laughs> with these Hollywood Kitchen episodes. It's really delightful. Well, thank you, and you and I will talk very soon. Yes, we will. Okay. Okay. Sorry. All right.